Hi, FS100 class. Here is a brief lecture on critical thinking, metacognition, and learning preferences, including information from Chapter 2 and Chapter 4. First, the definition of critical thinking is that we assess information, answer questions, and make decisions. And we do that based on asking questions about the information we're learning. Who, what, where, when, how, and why. We ask ourselves those questions as we're learning the information. When we are learning, we are trying to move from lower levels of learning to higher levels. And that's when we use Bloom's taxonomy. Remember the taxonomy is in the shape of a pyramid and we are going from the bottom to the top. So the first level of is knowledge, the second comprehension, third application, fourth analysis, fifth synthesis, and sixth and last highest level evaluation. When we are at the first level of knowledge, we are basically just memorizing. We're able to recognize the information and recall on a test. At the second level, comprehension, we're able to explain the information in our own words. We understand it well enough to be able to explain it to someone else. The third level application is where we use the knowledge in our lives. We use the knowledge and comprehension to solve new problems and we apply that knowledge to other classes and in our lives. The next level analysis is where we can break down the information into meaningful parts and know how those parts relate to one another. The next level is synthesis, where we make connections between unrelated or unknown facts to understand the topic. In this step, we usually are creating something, that's why it's called synthesis. And here's where you may have written research papers or written speeches or created a video or a website because that's where you were making connections with the facts. And the final level in the pyramid evaluation is where we're able to develop arguments based on our understanding of the topic and the evidence. So say we learn something in a class, then we read another article about it, and we can actually evaluate that article based on our thorough understanding of that topic. Now we're moving into chapter four, the chapter about understanding learning and learning preferences. Remember, even though this chapter talked about many different learning preferences, we all can learn in all of those ways. We have preferences, it's true, but the most powerful way to learn is to move beyond our initial preference and try lots of different techniques. One of the first suggestions is self-testing, creating practice tests for yourself. Our textbook has a chapter summary at the end of every chapter, and you could use that to write practice questions. If you test yourself, that's very powerful. It's even more powerful if you can use those practice tests with a partner or a study group. Another important strategy is called distributed studying, where we study a little bit each day over multiple days to promote our long-term learning. And this means studying even when there is not a test coming up, where you pick a topic and read over it or study your notes for 20 to 30 minutes each day or several days over the week. When you're doing that distributed studying, you can also use a technique called interleaved practice, where you switch between different topics when you're studying. So you study biology for 20 minutes, then you study FS for 20 minutes, then you look over your English notes for 20 minutes, and maybe even do a little bit of math for 20 minutes. And you do that every day, even when there's a test not coming up, or at least several times a week. When you are studying, there are two techniques to use as you're reading over your material. The first is elaborative interrogation. Basically, you're just asking why. 
When you are learning factual information, you ask yourself, why do I need to know this? Why is this important? That is elaborative interrogation. When you're asking yourself, then you can answer yourself, and that is self-explanation, where you ask yourself questions or generate examples. You could even think about little stories to explain the facts you're learning. When you use verbal and visual information at the same time and make connections, that is called dual coding. Again, remember, even though you might think of yourself as a visual learner, for example, you cannot learn using only the visual modality. You need to connect verbal and visual, and that's called dual coding. The rest of chapter four talks about many different learning preferences. And I would like you to look over that information, but please again remember that even though we might have a preference, we need to be multimodal learners. We can use different learning strategies based on the situation at hand. This would include verbal, visual, auditory, kinesthetic, the different preferences listed in the Myers-Briggs, doing practice testing, working alone, working with a group, using tutoring. All of these strategies are being a multimodal learner, which is one of the most powerful ideas in learning. To not just learn in one way, but to use many different methods which you can do as you're doing that distributed studying. Maybe one day you read over notes. Maybe another day you read the notes out loud. Maybe another day you make flashcards out of the notes. You spread your studying out over the week for distributed studying, and you use many different learning strategies to be a multimodal learner.